I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Mark James. I am president of the Malloy chapter of the what we call Malloy AUP, uh, which is the an acronym for the American Association of University Professors, uh, a, a, a nation, nationwide organization created in uh, uh, 1915 by um, people like Arthur Lovejoy and uh, the John Dewey and others uh, to, to safeguard uh, at what we now call academic freedom and to protect. Uh, the, 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 the academic profession um, against uh, uh, unnecessary termination or whatever because the, um, the pursuit of knowledge may put us in uh, conflict with established ways of thinking, the establishment in general. Uh, so the pursuit of knowledge um, makes it necessary for us to be able to um, uh, pursue things wherever they lead us. Um, I am extraordinarily pleased, extraordinarily honored to be able to introduce uh, to you Hank Reichman and Joan W. Scott, um, major, major figures in the national organization. Um, uh, Hank is the um, chair of Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure for the AAUP and chair of the board of directors for the AAUP Foundation. Um, Dr. Reichman is a graduate of Columbia University and earned a PhD in history at Berkeley. He's a historian of, of Russia and modern Europe, and he taught at numerous universities, including at Cal State University East Bay from 1989 to uh, 2015, where he three times chaired the uh, Academic Senate. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. And then there's Joan Wallace Scott, is also a member of uh, the Committee on uh, member of Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure for AUP, and a member of the Board of Directors for the AUP Foundation and also a former chair of the Committee on Academic Freedom and Tenure. Um, Dr. Scott re received her PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has taught at the University of uh, Illinois Chicago, Northwestern University, the University of North Carolina, Chapel, Ch Chapel Hill, and Brown University where she was the founding director of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. Since 1985, she's been a professor in the School of Social Science at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton University. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome to Joan Scott. And on a, on a personal anecdote, I, 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 was, I was trained on, on a good deal of your work uh, <laughs> in graduate school uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, so it's an, indeed an honor. Um, Thank you very much for coming, and I will now just hand it over because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Both of them have just come out with uh, books this year. Uh, Henry Reichman's The Future of Academic Freedom is available. Um, you can find it anywhere from uh, John, Johns Hopkins University Press, and then there's uh, Joan Scott's Knowledge, Power, and Academic Freedom, which also just came out this year uh, from Columbia University Press. And so you are getting the most up-to-date uh, ways of thinking about academic freedom, uh, f uh, freedom of speech, and the difference between those, tenure, and, uh, and some of the concerns and issues um, uh, related to these things uh, across the nation. So, and then they'll be going from here to the professional, what is the PSC? Professional, professional Staff Congress. Professional Staff Congress at, at the CUNY system to also uh, discuss some of these things. So please welcome Joan Scott and Hank Reichman. Mark, and is this working? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thanks to everybody for coming, especially the students. Um, and uh, it, it is really, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and a bit of an honor as well. Uh, I was just talking with, I was staying in Manhattan with a friend, and we both grew up on Long Island, and he said to me, he, he said, I, I'd never heard of Malloy College. And I said, neither had I, and, uh, but then I learned a whole bunch about it, and discovered the best thing about it, to my mind, is that you have a thriving AUP chapter, which is important. Um, so uh, what I want to do is, is sort of begin by talking about what is academic freedom, what we mean by it, um, and, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, tenure and the idea of tenure as the strongest protection for academic freedom. And then I want to briefly survey some of the major threats to academic freedom. Uh, so. Uh, when we talk about academic freedom, we're really talking about three basic elements. And, and the first thing to understand is that people don't think of, uh, they often think of academic freedom as if it were simply the application of free speech or even of the First Amendment to the Constitution to the university. 
Uh, and while I would argue that freedom of speech and academic freedom are, as I sometimes like to put it, close cousins, uh, they're not the same. Uh, and in some ways, academic freedom provides broader protection for faculty than, than freedom of speech does. In some ways, provides uh, less protection. Uh, moreover, from the AEP's perspective, academic freedom is something that belongs to the faculty uh, as a professional right, whereas freedom of speech belongs to all of us. Uh, as citizens of the United States. We have the right to speak our minds, uh, um, free of government interference, although not always free of the uh, discipline of our employers. For, in many jobs in the United States right now, if you speak out, you say something controversial, either at work or in public, uh, the employer may well have the right to simply say, look, I don't want to uh, keep a crazy radical or whatever it is, or, you know, like you on my staff, goodbye. Um, uh, unless there's a union contract or in government work, sometimes there can be protection, but even there it can be limited. Um, uh, so freedom of speech is a right we have against the government. Academic freedom is a professional privilege the faculty uh, have earned. Now, there's a, some people sometimes talk about student academic freedom, what we call the freedom to learn. And that gives students certain rights, etc., which we sometimes talk about as academic freedom, but are more closely uh, associated really with um, with free speech on the campus. Um, and that, that's not really my concern today, although I will say this, it's hard to imagine a university or a college where uh, student rights to speak out, uh, to invite guest speakers, to uh, have a free and independent student newspaper, to um, organize clubs, etc., and to ask difficult questions in class and maybe challenge their fellow students and faculty members about ideas. Campus where that is not possible, it's hard to imagine the faculty's academic freedom being well protected. Well, what does the faculty's academic freedom consist of? In the AAP, ever since 1915, we've considered it having three basic elements. First is the freedom to teach one's subject in class. Third, second, the freedom to research one's Topics, uh, of, of topics of one's choice and to control the results of one's research. And third, and this has often been the most controversial part of academic freedom, the freedom to speak as a citizen of both the institution itself and of the broader society without fear of institutional discipline. Now let me talk about each of these in turn. What do we mean by freedom of, uh, uh, in the classroom, freedom to teach? First of all, it's freedom to teach one's subject, not freedom to do whatever you, you want in the classroom. Uh, for instance, uh, I was told a story by a former member of, well, he's a former member of our staff only because he died virtually at his desk, um, but uh, a longtime member of the AAP staff, a story, he was once contacted by a professor who said, called up and said, I have an academic freedom case. They won't let, I'm an English professor, and they won't let me teach Jack Kerouac, the famous speed author of the 1950s. Uh, and, and he said, well, this is outrageous. English professor, why couldn't they teach Jack Carroll? It was because he's simply uh, controversial. But he followed up and he called, I don't know if it was the department chair or the dean, uh, and said, now what's this I hear about you aren't letting him teach Jack Carroll? And he says, hold on for a minute. He says, did he tell you it was in a course on 17th century British literature? <laughs> well, you could make an argument that maybe you could assign something from Jack Kerouac to compare with something by Shakespeare, etc. But that wasn't the guy intent. He, he wanted to teach 20th century American literature, but he was assigned to teach 17th century British literature, and that's what he had the freedom to teach. But his approach, his understanding of that, of that topic, but he was not free to, to change it. Moreover, faculty members are subject to the collective will of the faculty as a whole. If a faculty member is assigned to teach a general education course and the faculty as a whole has decided that course needs to have a certain minimum uh, amount of writing in it, you can't say, no, I'm only going to use uh, uh, multiple choice tests. Um, similarly, if it's a multi-section course, a faculty member has the uh, uh, Everybody wants to use a common textbook. This often happens, say, in an introductory math or calculus course. Um, the faculty member doesn't like the choice. Uh, the faculty member, the, the, the rights, we put out a statement a few years ago. We said the rights of the faculty as a whole to choose the, 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 the um, textbook trump the rights of the individual faculty. I wish we hadn't used the word trump. I wish we had said supersedes or something like that. But we, 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 we did it and we're stuck with it. Um, but uh, 
Uh, but we put a condition on that. We said if the decision was made by a democratic discussion of all those who regularly teach the class, not just arbitrarily by it, uh, an administrator or something to tell people what, what textbook they have to use. The faculty themselves who teach the course have to choose the textbook. And if, if an individual faculty member doesn't like the choice, that faculty member is free to argue against the textbook or to use alternative readings in addition, etc. But but it is the right the whole. Um, an important right of freedom in the classroom is the freedom uh, of grading. Uh, to be sure, faculty grades may be subject to the supervision of a broader faculty committee. If a student files a complaint that was an unfair grade, uh, it, it can go to a faculty committee, and the faculty committee can look at the situation and say, yes, that, that was unfair, it was discriminatory, perhaps. Uh, but that has to be a process in which the faculty member and the student both have the right uh, to present their case. It cannot be an administrator calling up a faculty member and saying, as is and too frequently been the practice of many campuses, look, your grades are too low. You know, uh, and we want to keep these students here, uh, so give, give, raise everybody. Or student X came in and complained, and you know uh, that student's parents are quite wealthy, and they might give a donation to the college, but they're not going to give it if you, if you, if you give this student a D. That's not legitimate. It is the faculty member's right uh, to determine their own uh, grades. One other aspect of freedom of the classroom that I think needs to be mentioned these days is uh, in, back in 1915, when the AAP was formed, we published this Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure, which is a document that's held up very well over the years. It's a little wordy by our standards today, but it's, it, it's really an excellent document. And one of the things they pointed out is that the, the, the classroom is a sac sacrosanct place. What goes on in the classroom should stay in the classroom. They didn't use that phrasing, but that's what they, they meant. Uh, and I think it's very important because what happens in, sometimes today is a student, and sometimes not even a student, just somebody who snuck into the classroom, uh, will record what the president, uh, the, the president, the professor says, uh, either videoing it or audio recording. Uh, and you can do that now, of course, very easily with cell phones without anybody knowing. And then sometimes uh, tendentiously editing it, putting it on the inter internet and saying, look what my, this professor is doing. Well, uh, you know, there are lots of reasons professors say things in, in class. Sometimes professors will, you know, play devil's advocate. Uh, we'll try to uh, present an argument that the professor doesn't agree with in order to draw out students to discussion, to say, look, what if somebody said this? Uh, and then the, the what if somebody said is dropped and <laughs> that's put up on the, uh, uh, on the internet. So um, uh, this is a, a growing problem uh, in academic freedom. And I want to turn to the second element of academic freedom, freedom in research. Uh, it's the freedom of faculty members to choose their own topics of research, uh, to choose their approach to the research, uh, and to choose what they will do with the research. It doesn't mean, of course, that their colleagues uh, have to approve of everything they research. We have processes in which people are reviewed for tenure, or promotion, etc., and the committee of colleagues say, look, we don't think your research is that good. Uh, they may be wrong in that evaluation, but that's th th their, their right uh, to establish um, their criteria. But it's the faculty's member members' right to, to choose the topic, to choose the approach. And here's what's most important, to choose what is done with their, their research. Uh, increasingly now, this is not so much in the social sciences and humanities, but it's happening a lot, particularly in big research universities, in technological fields, where what faculty's research could uh, might lead uh, to some kind of uh, patent that will make a lot of money. Uh, and the universities want a cut of that money. Now, it's legitimate if the university says, look, we just put a half a million dollars into a laboratory for you, and this laboratory led you to discover this new cure for cancer or what have you, uh, and the drug company is going to pay tens of millions for it. Well, well, we want something back in our investment. That's fair. And the faculty member in the university should negotiate those terms. But increasingly what universities are saying, irrespective of whether you're going to find anything or not, we don't even know what you're going to research. We don't even know if we're going to put any money in it. You will in advance sign over that any patentable material you do, patentable work you do on this campus, is the property of the university. And this is a very big change in American higher education, but not always the case. 
Uh, and for example, at the University of California, uh, they now require all uh, new faculty hires to sign what they call the patent agreement, which essentially signs over their rights. Uh, and, and there's concern, by the way, if beginning to emerge that they may not now ask this as well for copyright, uh, for writing books. Um, sign over the rights in advance to the university. Uh, and ironically, uh, if, you go, if you Google uh, University of California patent agreement, you can get to the actual form that faculty members have to sign. It's available online publicly. It turns out they have on one form, you have to sign two agreements. One is the patent agreement. The other is the state of California loyalty oath. Uh, which is now a kind of uh, generic oath of like, uh, you know, I will support the Constitution, but back in the 1950s was extremely controversial because people had to sign and claim that they were never communists and they were never in a uh, communist affiliated organization. The Supreme Court struck that down finally. Uh, uh, only after, by the way, some uh, dozen or 20, something, I can't remember the exact number, uh, Berkeley faculty members were fired. Uh, ultimately, the court compelled them to be rehired after a long struggle. So that's on the same page, ironically. Uh, but of course they can't impose that on people who are already hired. If it, it's basic law that once a contract is signed, it can only be changed with the agreement of both parties. Uh, so, you, you know, so they've asked all the already hired faculty to sign this agreement. Many of them did so just thinking, well, I'll never get anything patentable anyway, why do I care? But a, couple of, a number of them have said, no, I don't want to sign it. Now, one of them was a woman at the University of California, Santa Cruz, whose work is not patentable. She works on the psychology of gender roles, uh, and uh, she refused to sign it. But then she put in an application for a grant to the National Institutes of Health. Um, and it wouldn't be for any patentable research. Uh, but the NIH required her to get the university to sign off on the grant. And they said, we won't, because you haven't signed the patent agreement. The AAUP, we wrote a letter protesting on her behalf. Unfortunately, it did not work. Uh, and unfortunately, I, for reasons I don't quite understand, University of California faculty have not exactly taken up this fight. Now this brings me finally to the, um, uh, the third element of academic freedom. The one that gets us and that causes the most problems, which is what the right to speak as a citizen which we sometimes call the right of extramural expression. Extramural literally meaning outside the walls of the university. We don't mean the physical walls. We really mean outside the boundaries of the actual research and teaching one does. And this is where it gets controversial. Because what we say, and what the AUP has said from the beginning, is that a faculty member who speaks as a citizen uh, should have right, the right not to be disciplined by the institution. Uh, even though, even in, in a private institution in particular, like Molloy College, legally they might be able to do that, uh, depending upon what their faculty handbook says and what their contracts are. Uh, but we say that a faculty member's right to expression as a citizen needs to be protected, because if that right isn't protected, then their rights as researchers and as teachers will also probably not be protected. Now. In the 1940 Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure, the AUP uh, issued jointly with the Association of American Colleges, which is now called the Association of American Colleges and Universities. I hope I'm not boring the students too much with that. Um, is, uh, uh, we said there that this, they said, of course, faculty members, and I always forget the exact wording, but, but should always try to be accurate, make sure they're not to make clear they're not speaking on behalf of the institution, while well, faculty members never do when they speak as citizens. No one really speaks for the institution on anything except a uh, few issues. Um, they, uh, and, and to remember that they, they you know, uh, uphold the standards of the profession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what does that mean? We've come over the years to the conclusion that, that what that means is simply that it's advisory. It means Faculty members, they speak as citizens, should remember they're faculty members and, and not sound like crazy people. Uh, although, you know, like any other profession, we have our share of people who are a little, you know, wacky. <laughs> but, um, uh, but most important, what we come to the conclusion is, is the only time a faculty member's expression as a citizen should be relevant to discipline of the faculty member is when that expression goes to the fitness for the position. Now what does that mean, fitness for the position? Well, fitness for the position is, can you do the job? You know. Well, expression rarely, if ever, 
goes to fit for the position. But in some cases, it might. And let me give an example I think will illustrate this. Uh, currently, I thought he was retired, but I found out just last week that he's still there. Uh, there's an engineering professor at Northwestern University named Arthur Butts. Arthur Butts is also one of the country's premier Holocaust deniers. Uh, and these are, of course, very controversial ideas, of course, to say the least. They're actually rather hateful ideas. Uh, Northwestern has, has solved the problem that Jewish students in the class might feel intimidated by uh, assigning him only to teach um, classes that are not required. Uh, but he teaches there, and, and they let him speak about the, the, his Holocaust ideas. I mean, members of his department are regularly have, have you say, look, he's our colleague, we don't agree with him. He's, he's got his ideas, but that's his academic freedom. I, however, am an historian of 20th century Europe. If I were to become a Holocaust denier, or if I were I'll always been a Holocaust denier, or whatever, that would go to my fitness to teach 20th century European history. Uh, and so the irony here is uh, we have a colleague, Michael Barabay, who was on our committee for many years, who uh, teaches at uh, English at Penn State University, once put it his. The irony here is the less you know about a subject, the freer you are to speak about it. Um, which, in a certain sense, is kind of true. Uh, but it's essential to protecting uh, people's uh, academic freedom. And this is the place where free speech and academic freedom come closest. Uh, and in a sense, Academic freedom here is guaranteeing professors more free speech than the First Amendment might in other employment situations. A third area of academic freedom is one I alluded to when I talked about freedom in the classroom, which is the growing threat of uh, harassment on social media and even direct harassment of faculty members, either for comments they make in class or comments they make as citizens uh, exercising their right to what we call extramural expression. Uh, and we have literally dozens of cases coming before us uh, in the last few years where faculty members say something, uh, it's then uh, often distorted, but even if it isn't distorted, it's uh, spread all over to the internet, and suddenly the faculty members get threats. We have a case right now in Iowa, it's an interesting one, where a faculty member, some of his posts from Facebook from 2012, that's seven years ago, uh, were suddenly picked up by some right-wing websites and suddenly he started getting all sorts of threats. The community college where he taught got all sorts of threats. And they said that, well, we support his academic freedom. We, 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 he has the right to say this. But these threats are endangering our students, so we're going to fire him. Well, what is that? that sends a message to anybody. You want to get rid of a controversial faculty member, just start threatening violence against the campus and they'll get rid of them. So, you know, so these are the kind of threat, it's a major threat to academic freedom. But I would say that the single biggest threat to academic freedom today has been the deterioration of the tenure system. Some 25, 30 years ago or so, about two thirds of those people who taught in American higher education were either tenured or on the path to getting tenure. Today, that number is less than a quarter. Uh, increasingly, and the, the largest single group among teaching faculty are part-time adjuncts often on term-to-term -term contracts. And the problem there is a tenured faculty member or, a, or even a faculty pro member probationary for tenure has to be dismissed. There actually has to be a procedure to say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna remove you. Person on a short-term contract, even if they've been teaching at the institution for 15, 20 years, and this fellow at Iowa had been teaching there for over 24 years, last nine consecutively, uh, they, they don't have to be fired, they can simply be not renewed.